Okay, so let's start our third lecture in Introduction to Additive Manufacturing with a look at the history of additive manufacturing. Um, it may surprise uh, many of you uh, to know that additive manufacturing has actually been around for a really long time. Um, so uh, the, the basis of additive manufacturing is um, adding material in a sequential layer by layer manner to create a three dimensional object. And, um, and this process has basically been around since the Neolithic period. Um, there is pottery that has been found using the coil method. So the coil method would be an additive method. And you can see the example of this pottery here um, using coils to build up to create a base. Um, this this uh, pottery has been found uh, dating back 29,000 BC. Uh, that that's an incredibly uh, you know long period of time ago. So so it actually is a, a, a really old, if not the oldest, method for for making uh, objects. Um, and when you think about it, clay is an ideal additive manufacturing material because it starts as a pliable substance, something that we can shape into our, or move into our, the desired shape, uh, but then it can be fired um, or left to um, age and it becomes harder over time. So that's basically an ideal additive manufacturing material. Um, other early additive manufacturing, of course, they didn't call it additive manufacturing at that point, but um, we can see this in topography or topo topographical models, the models that are used to create, um, you know, dioramas or uh, kind of uh, structures that resemble the earth, mountains and, and landscape forms and things like that. Um, back in the uh, 19th century, so the you know, 1800s, um, there was a method called photo sculpture, which they used uh, to reproduce um, three dimensional shapes using um, a series of light sources that would move around, or in fact, the object would also rotate um, to create this, this uh, sculpturing process. Um, this is a page from the patent of, of that process, the photographic process for the reproduction of plastic objects. And you can see an example right here. Here's a live person. Um, I'm, that looks like a Civil War general. I'm not sure who that is, but um, the, the object right here is basically used to hold his head still. And this is, this plumb bob is used to kind of align him. And you can see he's on a table that's going to rotate and then over on the right hand side you can see the person kind of making the uh, uh, plastic sculpture um, I don't know much about this and <laughs> and honestly this this whole process kind of confuses me how they would use this I would love to see uh, to find a video of this process somebody doing this um, so maybe you can maybe you out there can can find uh, an example of that and send it to me um, then we move on to the actual uh, kind of the beginning of what we know as 3D printing or additive manufacturing. And the first uh, real step in that direction was a method called solid freeform fabrication, SFF. Um, and it's the polymerization of a photosensitive polymer. So basically a photosensitive polymer. Polymer is a is a is another word for plastic. So it's a it's a plastic that's liquid, okay, to start with, but then when it's exposed to light, right, photosensitive, so when the liquid polymer is exposed to light, it's going to solidify, okay? Um, and this was done at the intersection of two uh, computer-controlled lasers. So they used the lasers to, um, to, to shine the light on specific areas of the photosensitive polymer to polymer to solidify those areas, um, and uh, you know th this was the basically the the genesis of the whole three D printing um, uh, uh, technology. Okay, um, now moving on to kind of a timeline here um, that the the first that SFF was developed uh, in Japan by a doctor named Dr. Kodama 
in basically the first patent application for rapid prototyping technology was in May 1980. So really, we can mark that time, May 1980, um, with the first patent application as kind of the, the, the milestone, the, the starting line for the 3D printing process. Um, three years later in 1983, um, Charles Hull, another pioneer in this field, uh, developed uh, a, a machine uh, that does SLA rapid prototyping. Okay, SLA is stereolithography. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then uh, things kind of move quickly from that. As, as they do, remember back to our uh, disruptive technologies and uh, technological revolutions, things kind of take off when uh, people start inventing things and it's seeding ideas in, in other inventors and designers and scientists' brains uh, and they come up with uh, similar kind of offshoots of that. So in 86, we have the first patent issued for rapid prototyping technology, again by Charles Hull for stereolithography apparatus, that's the SLA. Uh, and also in 1986, he founded 3D Systems, which is a, a, a company that's still around, one of the founders. So really, that was the first 3D printing company, 3D Systems, okay, founded by Charles Hull, a pioneer in, in 3D printing. Uh, a year later, in 1987, we have the first commercial rapid prototyping system, the SLA-1, uh, and that was obviously produced by uh, 3D Systems. Um, and you can see that on the right hand side, he's standing in front of that first machine, which as you can tell, it's, it's a resin 3D printer. So what we will learn in this class is, is known as a, <clears throat> a VAT photopolymerization process. Um, it's, it's a large, uh, printing. Okay. Um, and, and there it is right there. By the way, um, up here, you will see a picture of Dr. Kodama, um, the Japanese researcher who, uh, first patented the RP tech, not rapid prototyping technology. Then in a, uh, in a separate 3D printing process, right? So right now, the only process that has been invented, patented, and, and producing anything is, um, the VAT photo, photopolymerization or the SLA process. So in 1987, Carl Deckard, files a patent for selective laser sintering, which is a different process. It's not using a, a photopolymer resin. Um, it is actually using powdered uh, plastic uh, to, um, to, to be basically uh, laser sintered together. So sintering is basically a process where you heat up, um, in, in this case, plastic powder and the plastic powder kind of melts together clumps to, to make the shape that you want. And so this is called selective laser sintering, SLS. This was patented in 1987 by Carl Deckard um, from, uh, yeah, so so from Carl Deckard. Um, in 19, two years later, there was a patent issued for selective laser sintering. So he filed it in 87, it was issued in 89. Um, and then now, you know, the, the avalanche, the, the, the snowball is, is really growing here. Um, fused deposition modeling, FDM, uh, by Scott Crump was patented, or excuse me, the patent was filed in 89. And then Stratasys, another company, uh, that, that actually in our 3D printing, uh, facility at, uh, Moraine Valley Community College, we have two Stratasys machines. Uh, Stratasys was founded by Scott Crump and his wife, Lisa Crump. Um, so they filed the patent in 89. Stratasys was founded. And it's Stratasys, you know, their, their initial claim to fame was, and, and still is to a large extent, the FDM process, fused deposition modeling, which is a, a again, a third process, right? So first process was SLA, which is VAT photopolymerization. Next came selective laser sintering, which is a fused deposition modeling process. Oh, excuse me, uh, which is a powder-based fusion process. And then the third process is a FDM or material extrusion process um, uh, from Stratasys. And then in 92, so three years later, the patent was issued for FDM to Stratasys. So that's basically the early timeline for the um, for the milestones in 3D printing, um, Dr. Kodama, Charles Hull, Carl Deckard, 
and uh, Scott and Lisa Crump uh, were really the founding members here, developing three distinct uh, rapid uh, uh, 3D printing technologies. Um, and uh, two companies, 3D Systems and Stratasys, were there at the beginning. Okay, now let's let's look at uh, a timeline of the other major additive manufacturing processes. Okay, so um, one of the things we'll learn in um, one of the later lectures is that rapid prototyping or additive manufacturing um, has standardized processes. Okay, um, and and basically this is these are standardized processes that we use to make um, uh, 3D printed objects. Right, additive manufacturing. So. Um, this is a timeline of those seven major processes. Okay, so we already talked about SLA, stereolithography. That falls under the category of VAT photopolymerization. That was founded um, in 1987, co year of commercialization. Let's, let's not, not necessarily when it was founded, but the first year of commercialization. That is when it was brought out to the public. Um, and the company is 3D Systems. Uh, that was uh, the Charles Hull. Okay, material extrusion, the process was fused deposition modeling, and that was Scott and Lisa Crump. Um, their company was Stratasys, and that was uh, commercialized in 1991. Then we have a process that um, kind of is, is in, the, in the back a little bit. Um, it, was an in, it was an early process because basically it was very easy to do. Um, it's called sheet lamination. Um, that's the that's the standard name for the process. The the actual process itself uh, was developed by a company called Helisys, uh, which is now Cubic Technologies. So it changed its name, um, but originally it was Helisys. And the process is called laminated object manufacturing or LOM, and that was also commercialized uh, in 1991. Powder bed fusion or selective laser sintering. Uh, powder bed fusion is the standard category title. The process is called selective laser sintering. Um, and that was uh, developed by a company called DTM, which was acquired by 3D Systems. And that was uh, commercialized in 1992. Then we have binder jetting. The first process using that, uh, that standard um, was, uh, category was direct shell production casting. And that was, uh, the company was called Sologen, which is not around anymore. Um, and uh, that was commercialized in 93. Then we move on to material jetting. First process was inkjet printing, uh, abbreviated 3DP. And that was developed by Z Corp, which was also acquired by 3D Systems. And that was commercialized in 1996. And then finally, the last one, directed energy deposition. Uh, the process is known as laser engineered net shaping or lens, and that the company was Optomec, which is still around. And then the year of commercialization was uh, 21 years ago in 2000, year 2000. So those are the the beginnings of each one of the stand, seven standard categories of additive manufacturing. That photopolymerization, material extrusion, sheet lamination, powder bed fusion, binder jetting, material jetting, and directed energy deposition. Okay, and you can see those, um, basically all of them before 2000 with the, with the exception of directed energy deposition. All right, so let's look at some application milestones then. Um, in 1999, the first lab-grown organ is implanted in humans. Lab-grown organ, why is that significant? Well, the scaffolding for that was, um, was 3D printed. So basically scaffolding, you know, basically when you're, when you're, uh, and, and we'll have a slide, uh, the, actually the next slide talks about this. Um, so I'll hold off on explaining that until we see the next slide. In 2002, scientists engineer a miniature functional kidney using 3D printing technology. 2008, first person walks on a 3D printed prosthetic leg with all parts, knee, socket, or knee, foot, socket, etc. Okay. 2009, uh, we have the first 3D bioprinter prints the first blood vessel. Then moving on to 2011, engineers design and fly the first 3D printed aircraft. 2011, again, world's first 3D printed car is made. 
And then in 2012, doctors and engineers in the Netherlands used 3D printer to print a customized prosthetic lower jaw, okay, out of metal. All right. So those are some application milestones. Um, and let's look a little bit more at each one of these. So bioprinting, we talked about bioprinting and really the first four uh, application milestones here all involve bioprinting. Um, so we have the first 3D printed bladder, um, and this is a 3D printed kidney that he's holding up. I hope uh, the, the person that used that gets it back soon. Um, and then we have 3D printed bladder scaffolding. The scaffolding is necessary um, because the, the 3D printed cells need a structure to kind of build them up um, or to allow them to assume a three-dimensional shape. And so that's, uh, that's what the, 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 the scaffolding does um, and the 3D printing, uh, the, the 3D printed bladder, the, the 3D printing involves the deposition or the, the layering of the cells, okay? Um, and the scaffolding just allows the cells to assume a three-dimensional shape. Um, now we, we move to the first 3D printed blood vessel. Again, you know, you can see the scaffolding here. So uh, they have a hot, what's, what's called a hydrogel. And basically your, um, the, the 3D printer is injecting these cells in this hydrogel. And the hydrogel allows the cells to be uh, built up layer by layer. So the hydrogel is the, is kind of the, the slush that the uh, 3D printed cells are deposited in. Um, and the hydrogel is built up layer by layer in a, in a three-dimensional manner um, so that the, uh, basically the, the cells can assume a, a blood vessel type shape. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. That was early bioprinting. Um, so uh, we, had, we talked about the world's first 3D printed car, um, the Irby. Uh, you can see that right over here. It's kind of neat looking. I, this is a, um, a, a photo rendering of it. So, um, uh, you know, this, this is not the actual uh, car on the road. Um, the, the company was called Core Ecologic, and uh, it unveiled the, the Irby at the uh, TED. Remember the TED Talks? TED uh, Talk in Winnipeg. Um, it, go, it gets 200 miles per gallon on the highway, 100 miles per gallon in the city, and it's estimated retail for 10,000 to 50,000. That's a pretty big range right there. It, of course, did not go into production. It was more of a prototype. Um, the, the body was what was 3D printed, okay? Um, it, uh, the, the engine and, and the chassis and all the other stuff was, was not 3D printed, but the body was 3D printed. Um, I'm not sure that you would want to get into an accident uh, or want to be inside the car when the car got into an accident. But uh, as a prototype, it really set the stage for this. Um, and we'll see that there's now 3D printed vehicles out there that you can actually buy and drive. Um, we talked about this in the first um, in, in the first lecture, uh, the world's first 3D printed aircraft. Uh, this was developed by engineers at the University of Southampton uh, in the UK. Um, and it was a, uh, it's, it's basically a remote control plane. Um, the unmanned aircraft is built in seven days, uh, for a budget of 5,000 pounds, which, you know, um, probably is close to six or $7,000 American dollars. It was built using a SLS selective laser sintering process, which is a plastic, uh, uh, fusion process. Um, and the plane, as we talked about in the lecture, I, I would, point you back to the first lecture where you can see the videos of it. Um, it has a, a really cool elliptical wing shape, which is very efficient, very uh, good wing shape. Um, and it has uh, a lot of the um, electronics and all that stuff kind of built into the fuselage to, to minimize, uh, uh, you know, the, the assembly process and, and all the other stuff. So it's a very, very cool um, plane. Um, now, I included this because when I first started teaching this class in, in 2018, um, you know, this, of course, major milestones in 2018 was remarkable. Um, I decided to leave this in here as, as just kind of a marker for what was going on in 2018. 
Um, so uh, there were some big things going in 2018. I don't think 2018 was uh, any more or less remarkable than any of the other years that were, you know, that, that came afterwards or maybe slightly before that. But um, it's still kind of interesting. I'll let you read these. Some of the interesting uh, things here was HP uh, developed the multi-jet fusion um, and metal jet. So, uh, you know, those, those are out now and, uh, you know, they're, they're more, you know, mainstream. They're still not home 3D printing processes. They're, they're commercial and industrial, but, um, that was, that was a pretty big deal at the time, uh, HP getting in the market. Um, the market at the time, uh, was, uh, uh, expected to increase by, uh, 9% in 2018. Um, and, uh, the automation of additive manufacturing, right, could represent a market of 11.2 billion by 2027. That, that would be interesting to go back. Uh, this was from, uh, the, the Woolworths report, which is a famous, um, yearly report about the 3D printing industry or additive manufacturing. And it would be interesting to go back and see, um, you know, how close they are to that, looking, of course, at 2021 numbers. Um, largest 3D printer in the world was developed by Ingersoll Machine Tools. Um, a, a 1 million diode laser pro fusion AM technology um, uh, using 1 million diodes. That Instead of a laser, a diode is basically a, a uh, uh, electrical light, right? Um, Mass production of 3D printed parts. We'll talk a little bit about this. Um, what's interesting here is the metal, right? Metal is really starting to catch on, right? Before, um, you know, if you if you look at all the earlier my, milestones, of course, they all, uh, you know, were, were um, plastic technologies, plastic 3D printing. Uh, metal came on with the uh, with the advent of powder bed fusion. Um, and kind of the same technology that we use for selective laser sintering, but we replace the, um, the, the plastic powder with metal powder, um, and then, you know, jack up the power of the laser to melt the metal together. We'll talk more about that, but, you know, metal 3D printing is something that the industry was really yearning for, looking for, and it, you know, came to fruition around the 2000, you know, uh, mid 2000s, uh, excuse me, mid 20 teens, I'll say. Um, 3D printed cornea and spinal implants. Um, titanium, again, 3D printed metal, titanium. Of course, titanium is not, um, the, the body, the, the reason titanium is critical for medical uh, implants is because um, the body does not reject titanium. So uh, that's why, you know, if you have any surgery and they put like metal plates or metal screws in, you know, broken bones or whatever, they always use titanium because your body is not going to reject it. So the ability to 3D print titanium is huge in the medical um, industry. Um, and then uh, 3D printed electronics directly on the skin. So uh, this was a really cool idea. You, you know, you, you can 3D print um, metal that is conductive in, a, in, a, in an electrical manner. Um, and then you can uh, basically uh, apply that directly on the skin. Uh, so, so it kind of sticks and it adheres to the skin. And then, boom, you have electronics that are on. We're talking on the skin, not in the skin, but on the skin. It's kind of like a tattoo, you might say. Of course, it's, it's removable, but that's really remarkable. Uh, and there's still that going on. Okay. Now this is more recent. So I wanted to share with you some more recent, um, things that are going on. Uh, Cincinnati Incorporated's BAM big area additive manufacturing 3D printing. This is a huge machine, right? I, I'm, I'm not sure you can tell the size of it, but it's basically the size of a car, right? This, this area right here is the size of a car. Um, this is a plastic, so it's basically just a material extrusion process, just like the printers that you might have at home, uh, the printers that we have at the uh, in the Moraine Valley Lab. Um, but big area additive manufacturing means that it's just using a big area and kind of this large uh, uh, deposition head um, 
And then we also have, this is the Ingersoll Machine Tools Wham 3D printer, which is even bigger. Uh, basically, you can see it here. Uh, I'm, I'm, it looks like this picture, they're printing a mold for a uh, giant wind turbine. Um, and just to give you a scale, those are computer screens down there. Okay, so this is huge. Um, now, uh, again, we have um, aerospace parts. Aerospace was one, as, as we'll talk about and find out, aerospace was really an industry that grabbed hold of 3D printing and ran with it. So they love 3D printing. Um, there's a lot of development in the aerospace industry with 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Here we can see a part, right, that is um, uh, uh, built or, or 3D printed. Uh, using the direct metal laser melting process. Um, and it is a bracket uh, made out of a cobalt chrome alloy. So it's 3D printing cobalt chrome alloy, which is amazing in and of itself. Um, it needs to be out of that material because it's in, uh, it's going to be placed in this engine. So I believe it's a hinge. Um, it's a hinge that is used um, uh, to, to, uh, in, in the engine to allow it to, you know, to, to move or do, I don't think you can see it in this picture, but it needs to be made out of the special metal because it's an extremely hot environment. Uh, and what's critical here is that it offers a 10% weight reduction. Again, this is why aerospace loves it, uh, loves additive manufacturing because you can, um, you can reduce the weight, but you can design it so that it's still as strong. And so what we see here, and we'll talk about this, but what we see here is a mixing of uh, topological optimization um, using CAD processes, uh, you know, computer aided design processes, uh, topological optimization to reduce the weight, but maintain the required strength. And that's all that the aerospace industry is about. We need it to be strong, but we need it to be lighter and lighter because that makes the air aircraft more efficient. Um, and it has a 90% weight reduction. Okay. Um, let's look at a couple of other things here. So here, this is a titanium uh, implant printed in 3D, uh, excuse me, printed using 3D, uh, 3D printing process. Um, it's titanium again. It is a spinal implant. Okay. So you can see it right here in the picture on the right. Um, and basically, um, it, it adds this high geometric complexity. Um, it, you can print it, uh, customized to each patient, each patient's shape of their bones and their, uh, and, and their own customized geometry using, uh, MRI technologies to, to basically scan the body, get the exact shape, and then put that into a CAD model and, and 3D print it. So you have, you know, extreme customization, which is great for medical applications. Um, the, the, uh, kind of th this shape, I don't know how you can print this lattice like shape here, um, promotes bone growth, right? So it mimics, uh, what our bones look like on the inside. And so it, it, it helps, um, existing bone to kind of adhere to it to make a, a better bonding process. Um, so th this is a, a huge process for, um, uh, for, uh, for medical 3D printing. Um, and then we have, uh, four images here. Uh, let's start in the top left. So this is, um, of course the, uh, the stealth fighter, the F-35 stealth fighter. Um, and, uh, this, uh, this plane right here, the Marines managed to save $70,000 through 3D printing, um, by using an additive manufacturing process to 3D print a small component for this, uh, for the stealth fighter. They saved the money. And as they avoided having to purchase a completely new landing gear door for the plane. All right. So 3D printed, um, in the field, right? So you just need a 3D printer and the CAD model, which can be sent, um, over the internet, um, or, or over, you know, uh, cloud and wireless technologies. 
Then moving to the to the right over here, we have this cute little car. This is the Yo-Yo. It's a 3D printed electric car. It's made in Italy uh, by a company called XEV, Italian company. Um, this is the okay. So uh, so so the 3D printed car. Um, all the visible parts were 3D printed. Um, with the exception, the only things that weren't 3D printed on this car was the chassis, the seats, and the windshield. Um, excuse me. Yeah, the chassis, the seats, the windshield. The engine was also not 3D printed. I should add, I should add that. Um, that one, that hits the market in 2020. Now, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know whether because of COVID and the pandemic, whether that actually hit the market. I would imagine that in 2020 in Italy, probably they had to put that on hold, but maybe look for that. Um, the company managed to reduce the number of components from 2000 to only 57. That is amazing. 2000 to 57 resulted in a lightweight design that weighs 450 kilos. Okay. Um, now moving down here to the bottom, uh, left. Okay. We have the world's first 3d printed e-bike, right? Um, and th this is, this is, whoops, this is amazing as well. Um, the first 3d printed e-bike. Um, it's called the Nera, N-E-R-A, um, and with uh, added manufacturing and rapid prototyping, you can get from the first idea to a fully functioning motorcycle in just 12 weeks. That That's phenomenal for designing anything, but let alone a, a motor vehicle. Um, it's a fully functioning motorcycle, right? Um, it's fully 3D printed with from only 15 parts. Right. The only things that are not 3D printed, similar to the car, was the battery, the motor, uh, and the cable and control systems. Okay. Um, and so I'm sure that you can buy that if you wanted to buy an e-bike. That's what what I really like about it. What's amazing is the tires are 3D printed too. Right. You can see that shape right there. Um, so that's amazing. Um, and then finally, we have this odd looking vehicle right here. This is called the Solar Voyager, and it's a 3D printed vehicle, electric vehicle, going to Antarctica. So you can see the solar panels here. They're helping to provide power to it. Um, and uh, it's it's 3D printed um, by a company called Clean to Antarctica, um, and it's a Dutch company. Um, it's 16 meters long. It weighs 1,485 kilograms. It can reach a speed of eight kilometers per hour and contain food for 47 days. Um, so the way that this was printed, it was printed with 4,000 3D printed hexagonal blocks. Uh, these blocks are called a hex core and they look like a honeycomb structure. Um, and they provide lightness, but also or weight reduction, but also strength. Um, so and it's shredded plastic waste and melted it to make the, the plastic filament that is then constructed into these hex core honeycomb shape. So, uh, you know, that, that's an amazing kind of, uh, process of, of recycling. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, can I say about this? Um, it was, uh, it was made using 40 3d printers. It took 200 pounds of plastic to design the chassis box alone. All right. Um, now, the last thing I want to say is kind of an open question to you to, uh, you know, do your own uh, looking ar around the Internet and uh, out in the media um, and, and, you know, kind of look and see what major additive manufacturing news there is in 2020 or 2021. OK, what's out there right now? Um, I would point you to uh, metal additive manufacturing, which continues to be kind of the driving force for major production, uh, both in automotive, of course, in aerospace, uh, getting into even um, uh, the medical uh, fields. But but that's really um, a, a, a major impact out there now. These processors are being more and more refined. Uh, then we also have resin additive manufacturing or using the VAT photopolymerization. Um, I know that there are shoes out that are now 3D printed using these resin processes. Um, and so you can look at that. Um, additive manufacturing materials is, is really, um, you know, uh, moving leaps and bounds where the, where the technology is kind of set, right? How you 3D print things is, is kind of set. 
Um, even though there are some new processes coming out or new ish, I, I, you know, kind of tweaks on existing processes. Materials is kind of the wild west at this point. And then also additive manufacturing production techniques, production technologies, and additive manufacturing applications. So have a look at those five areas and see if you come up with anything uh, that's that's new, uh, you know, extraordinary, that, that's really, um, uh, you know, jumping ahead, jumping out at you. Um, and, uh, you know, let me know what you find, of course. Um, and that's going to finish up our our lecture on the history of additive manufacturing. Thank you very much.